Check out the 7th Fall for Dance North Festival from September 11th to October 29th. The festival's collection of original live streams will be presented from Toronto but can be streamed from anywhere, and it includes new works from Guillaume Cote, Azure Barton, and Tutuzile November, and more. Explore the season at ffdnorth.com. Dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. And I'm Amy Brandt. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, we will talk about the ways that boys in ballet are both disadvantaged and privileged, um, as prompted by a new initiative that Ballet Organ just launched to offer emotional support to young male dancers. We will take a look at the state of dance academia because the value of a dance degree has never been more apparent, and yet the contributions of the adjuncts who make dance departments run continue to be undervalued. And we will talk about the return of social dance, which faces a totally different set of pandemic-related challenges than concert-based dance. Um, first up, though, we just wanted to say thank you to all of you who heeded our calls on social media this past week and sent in your suggestions for our next mailbag episode. Much appreciated. Um, for the uninitiated, mailbag episodes are moments when we take time out from the headlines to address topics sent in by listeners, by you. So if there are any big picture dance issues you think we should dig further into, or if you have a particular dance obsession that you want us to shine a spotlight on, let us know. Drop us a comment or a DM on Instagram. We're at the.dance.edit. Or you can add us or DM us on Twitter at dance underscore edit. I mean, we truly, we sincerely appreciate your input. And it's also just really nice to hear from you all. Okay, now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown. Here we go. Former Hamilton cast member Suni Reed has filed a discrimination complaint against the show. Reed, who is non-binary, alleges that producers retaliated and refused to renew their contract after they requested a gender-neutral dressing room and made several social media posts about discrimination concerns at the show. They also claim that they were harassed by cast members, physically threatened, and purposely misgendered. The show is denying the allegations. Yeah, not great. We've linked to some detailed coverage of the complaint in the show notes. Here is some dance news from the science world. NYU's Center for Ballet and the Arts has partnered with the Rockefeller University for a new research fellowship that explores the genetic and evolutionary reasons that humans and other animals dance. Um, the idea is to figure out, first of all, what actually happens in our brains when we dance, and then to potentially develop new clinical theories based on those findings. Like, for example, maybe different areas of the brain are linked in a way that might allow therapists to use dance to help patients whose neural circuits have been impacted by injury or disease. And re researchers are also going to use genome sequencing to determine whether people who specialize in dance actually have genetic things in common as compared to non-dancers. Mm. I don't know. This all sounds fascinating. Dance can teach us so much about our brains. I know. I know. I'm looking forward to when the research comes out. I mean, I'm assuming it'll probably be a while until we hear anything but yeah i think it's early stages yet but we will certainly yeah. keep you all posted boston ballet has launched uni a free streaming platform featuring dance films and virtual reality performances each piece was choreographed or staged for this specific platform so for instance i think helen pickett's pedal has been filmed in 360 um mm -hmm. so you're really immersed in the dancing and the content will be refreshed each season so they'll be continually adding new new works, um, you can go to uni, uni.bostonballet.org to see more. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I know. It's an example of a digital venture that I think was prompted by the pandemic, but is now like continuing and growing even as live shows have resumed. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, the aim is just to make dance more accessible to everybody. And, totally. and it, it is free. It costs nothing to the, the audience members. So yeah, hopefully it brings in some new people. 
Here is some bad news out of Boston. Last week, a group of mostly Asian women who were filming a K-pop dance video in the downtown crossing area of the city were harassed by a man for wearing masks. Uh, The dancers were members of the Boston and LA-based dance group Hush Crew, and one of them documented part of the incident in a video that ended up going viral on TikTok. She said that the man was not only yelling at them for wearing masks, but also ranting about communism, which yikes. We've included a link to the boston.com story about the incident in the show notes. American Ballet Theater is partnering up with Equinox to offer a ballet-based fitness class. The 50-minute classes, which will be available at about 20 locations in New York City, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., were developed by ABT Corps member Katie Boren and Equinox instructor Chris Vo. I believe he has some professional dance experience. I think he has a, a ton of it. Yeah. Yeah. So very cool. Um, apparently, the classes include center bar, across the floor exercises, jumps and turns, and TheraBand exercises. I am uh, continually amazed at ABT and their corporate partnerships. They really leaned into those hard between, you know, cruise lines and LG and now Equinox. I know. I was going to um, say, yeah, Equinox does feel at least, I mean, just a little more natural than like an LG. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I love that Chris Vo is is the leader of this on the Equinox side. Because, yeah. yeah, he dates with Bart Lubavitch and on Broadway. And he's been at Equinox for a long time, yeah. I think. So definitely understands how to bring ballet into the gym in a, in a meaningful way. Okay, here is some exciting news for fans of musicals and or Britney Spears. And I have a feeling there's large overlap in that Venn diagram. The long-awaited Britney Spears jukebox musical, Once Upon a One More Time, has announced complete casting for its DC premiere, which is happening next month. And I mean, actually, it's mostly the same people who were previously cast in the show's COVID-canceled Chicago run that was supposed to happen in April 2020. Justin Guarini is back on. Brita Heelan is also one of the leads. Ryan Steele, our favorite, is still in there. Um, we'll include a link to the whole cast list in the show notes. But I think we're really just excited to finally see Keone and Mari Madrid's choreography for this thing. Yeah. yeah, should be fun. Yeah, I also can't think of another show that might end up like actually benefiting from a COVID delay the way this show might. Doesn't this feel like such a perfect moment to be celebrating yeah. Britney right. now that she's free for conservatorship? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In other fun news, 18-year-old activist Greta Thunberg rickrolled the crowd at a climate concert in Stockholm, dancing along to Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Uh, Rick Astley has approved the move on his own Twitter account, so it's kind of funny. She's quite the dancer, I have to say. She is. She's got moves. I mean, (laughs) sorry, not sorry for including this in the headline rundown. I know it's not really news. I just think it's delightful. She has a minute to, like, not carry the weight of the whole world on her shoulders. <laughs> right. Well, usually when you see her, it's, she's so serious and, and talking about such serious topics. So it was kind of fun to see her let loose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To look like the teenager she actually is. Mm-hmm. So our first longer discussion segment today is about boys in ballet, which is a topic I, you could write a book about. It's so layered and, and complex. But the reason that we're bringing this up now is because of an initiative called Boys Who Dance, which was recently launched by Canada's Ballet Jorgen. And the initiative is designed to provide mentorship and emotional support to young male-identifying ballet students to help them overcome bullying and negative stereotyping and the, the sense of isolation that a lot of these dancers feel. And Amy did a great piece for Point about that initiative. Um, but we also wanted to acknowledge that those challenges are only part of the picture here, because while male ballet dancers are more likely to be bullied and ostracized outside the studio, inside of it, they're often accorded many more privileges than their female peers. They're given scholarships, they're lavished with attention. And that's a really complicated mix of messages for any young person to be getting. Yeah. And just just to kind of um, update you on Bally Organ's program, what they're doing is that it's an international initiative. Um, they kind of jumped on the, you know, the virtual platform that COVID-19 kind of made happen around the world and are mm-hmm. using that to really reach as many um, young dancers as they can. So young young boy students between the ages of 9 and 17 can basically sign up to have a virtual mentorship with one of Bally Organ's professional male dancers. I think there's seven or eight of them. And it's kind of a one-on-one virtual mentorship for as long as the dancer needs, like once a week they meet with them. Um, 
And anything they want to talk about is on the table. And, you know, obviously, one of the biggest issues for boys in ballet is the bullying and harassment. And often they have a lack of family support, you know, Mm -hmm. um, family members who don't like that they're dancing and things like that. So this kind of gives them a chance to talk to someone who kind of understands what they're going through and has been through it themselves and um, can offer them insight and help and all of that. But, you know, I, in my interview with um, Callum McGregor, who's one of the dancers there, you know, he said, but there are other issues that they want to talk about too. Just like everyday things, like how to balance school with dance class, um, body image issues, which is a, something that, you know, men also experience and, and other things. So it just kind of gives them an opportunity to reach out to a male role model, which you know, especially in smaller studios, uh, in smaller towns around the country, you know, they may not have a male teacher, they may be the only boy in their class, the only boy in their Mm -hmm. school. So this kind of gives them an opportunity to, to look for a role model in that way. And then in addition to that, they're also doing virtual town halls, bringing in a lot of guest speakers, other male dancers, mental health experts on a variety of topics throughout the year. And and you're, you know, you can ask questions, they're interactive, and everything's virtual. So it's really open to anyone around the world who wants to reach out. Yeah, so it's a nice initiative. Yeah, it sounds like a great program. And I mean, there are definitely there are real scary statistics about the bullying of of young men studying dance. Mm-hmm. I think the documentary Dancer from what was that 2018 that came out? I think it said 85% of male dance students are bullied. And I mean, anyone who grew up in dance and especially ballet is familiar with homophobia, the inaccurate rhetoric that goes mm-hmm. with that. Ballet is effeminate, that whole stereotype. That's definitely a crisis. And mm-hmm. I mean, those stereotypes are pervasive enough that like Lair Spencer can joke on Good Morning America about Prince George taking ballet classes and like mm-hmm. assume that everyone is in on the joke. Um But yeah, I mean, I think then it is worth talking about how, because there are far fewer male ballet students than female students, boys are usually told that they're special from the beginning, whereas female students are told they're a dime a dozen, they're interchangeable, they're less valuable. And given that dynamic, you know, it doesn't seem like a coincidence that male dancers down the road are more likely to end up as artistic directors, as choreographers, Mm -hmm. as like people with power in ballet that people talk about the glass elevator for men in ballet as opposed to the glass ceiling for women. Um, and and I think it's worth thinking about how that imbalance plays a part in the exploitative dynamics within some ballet companies that we've talked a lot about recently where male directors or dancers often get away with just really bad behavior, even abusive behavior for long periods. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we're talking about how like abusive behavior is learned, which is an idea that we really got into when we were discussing that Luke Jennings piece about the Royal Ballet School and abuse of the Royal Ballet School, these men who were bullied as children because they were dancers, some of them then might end up becoming bullies themselves as they enter these ballet world positions of power. There's just so much to hold in your head at one time in terms of what the situation looks like for young male dance students. Yeah, the dynamic is is really interesting. I I remember when I was um in high school growing up and the, one of my classmates, again, the only the only guy in my class, uh we both auditioned for kind of a prestigious summer program and uh we both got in and I was so excited to just and I just got in. I didn't get a scholarship, just to get in. I you know, yeah. I was so excited to just get in and he was upset that his scholarship wasn't a full ride. <laughs> and I remember being like, <laughs> yeah. that was like a very eye opening to me about where we stood as far as like expectations and what, you know, because he was mm-hmm. used to getting full scholarships to, you know, every school that he auditioned for. And it was challenging to be faced with like a question, you know, question mark, like, oh, well, here's a partial scholarship. But, mm-hmm. um, and that was kind of the first time I was really like, oh, wow okay, like we're not in the same planet when it comes to how we uh, see things or how the world sees us, I guess. There have been there were instances too in my career where I, you know, found out my male partner was, you know, during guesting was like getting per diem and I wasn't, you know, things like that. They have like more negotiating power. Yeah, that was like not fun. Um, They have a little more negotiating power from a much younger age. You know, they can Mm -hmm. kind of pick and choose between all the scholarships they're getting, et cetera. And then sometimes that means that the standard is a little lower, too, because, like, companies just Mm -hmm. want to hire. Male bodies. Yeah. So 
it's interesting. It's interesting. I will say that, you know, guys don't always have like a super easy time in dance companies. I mean, I've had a lot of, I, I know some, I have some friends who've, you know, struggled to get jobs or hold on to jobs. You know, it's not all like an easy ride for guys, but it is kind of, it does seem to that they much have a much easier path to uh, getting where they need to be than women do for sure. Yeah, except then sometimes because that path was easier, they're not as well prepared for the jobs that they ultimately take, as you were, as you were saying, and mm-hmm. that can lead to other problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess, uh, hopefully, as we start to talk more about this stuff, we can, at the same time, start to break the cycles of like bullying and homophobia, while also acknowledging privilege where it does exist, mm-hmm. and in a way that allows, you know, young boys to develop into healthy professional dancers. Right. Yeah. But I do, I do, um, you know, I think what Ballet Oregon is doing is wonderful. And it'd be great to see more companies and schools kind of following suit just, just to offer more emotional support for these, yeah. these young boys who are struggling so much. I mean, more emotional support for young dancers generally. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, please, we've linked in the show notes, Amy's great story about that. Please do go check it out. So next up today, we want to talk about two recent stories that taken together, give a good sense of sort of the state of dance academia right now. So first, Dance Future Magazine did a piece about the value of a dance MFA. And though it did focus on that graduate degree specifically, its conclusions about the ways that that kind of physical and theoretical inquiry pay off, those conclusions apply to undergraduate dance degrees too. Basically, the takeaway is studying dance in higher ed equips you with extremely valuable skills. The second story is a dance magazine piece by choreographer and educator Kimberly Bartosik that looks at what happens to the dance artists who end up back at those higher ed institutions as employees. And that one's pretty grim because most of these artists are brought on as adjuncts, which means they're non-salaried, they don't receive benefits, despite the critical role they play in pretty much every dance department. So there's a lot to talk about and frankly to rant about here. (laughs) Hold hold us back. <laughs> I, I think that this does apply to adjuncts across the board, because I could certainly yes. think of yeah. one of my mentors in college who was an adjunct professor. Uh, he, he taught several of my journalism classes, and I don't want to speak for him, but I sensed that he struggled with the same type of issue here. That was a lot of the responses to that sort story on social media I was seeing where people saying, hey, by the way, this isn't just dance adjuncts. This is all adjuncts. Right. They are yeah. all exploited in this way. Yeah. And they're valuable teachers. I mean, I, I learned so much from him. One of the things that really struck me about Kimberly's essay was about all the little extras that come with the job, the administrative mm-hmm. upkeep, the like Zoom calls, the prep time, the meetings with dancers, all of that stuff that just adds to the time commitment that you put in, but yet you're not compensated for that time. You're only compensated mm-hmm. for your class time. It, and that adds up. Mm-hmm. That adds up. I mean, she was basically saying, I feel like I, I'm working full time, but for a part time position. Right. So. Yeah. Another thing that she pointed out was that while, yes, adjuncts in every department struggle with these kinds of issues, there's something especially cruel about not providing health insurance for dance educators who literally rely on their bodies mm-hmm. for their livelihoods. Mm-hmm. Like, if you get hurt on the job at school, you don't have health insurance from that school to fall back on, and it can affect the the rest of your career. So that's complicated. Right. I mean, I think it's it's worth acknowledging, and, and Kimberly does this in her story, too, that most of these dance artists don't want like tenured positions. They're not mm-hmm. in it for full time, you know, long term contracts like that. I think a lot of them appreciate the flexibility schedule wise mm-hmm. that some of these adjunct jobs offer. But there's got to be some sort of in between ground where they're better compensated and they get better benefits to make, as you're saying, Amy, all of that, all of the labor that goes mm-hmm. into these jobs to, to make sure that that labor is recognized and valued appropriately. Yeah. And there's also no job security. I mean, you could be teaching. Yes a full load of classes one semester and then be given two classes the following. It reminds me of freelancing. I mean, I guess that's how they look at adjuncts, right? As freelance mm-hmm. contractors in a way. So, um, and just, I don't know, when you think about the cost of higher education and all of that money <laughs> that you put into it and to hear that like the teachers working with you for the class that you're paying for is not really getting compensated well for that. It, it's heartbreaking. Um, again, we're really mostly directing you to 
Kimberly Barto's excellent piece on all of this. She, I mean, clearly she has personal experience with this issue, and she also does a good job laying out all these concerns and also talking about potential solutions to them. Yeah. She also mentions that since the article has been published, the dance department she worked for, you know, re- responded positively and that there's hopefully some discussions going forward. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Journalism working. Yay. <laughs> Um, so in our final discussion segment this episode, we want to take a look at the return of social dance, because we've talked at great length on this podcast about the pandemic related challenges facing concert dance companies and theatrical productions as they try to resume performances. But social dance is a totally different Ball game, just a bad metaphor to use there. A, a recent story in the New York Times talked about how tango, which is a dance where you're literally cheek to cheek with a partner who you've often never met before. Tango's been trying to rebound. And there was also a big AP photo roundup documenting how people around the world are beginning to dance again, which mostly looked at social dance settings. And it seems like there are just infinitely more variables to deal with in these kinds of environments, sort of by design, like by their very nature. Yeah, I, I like well, tango. You're so close. I mean, you're you're cheek to cheek, chest to chest. You know, and um, it was interesting to hear in the article in the New York Times uh, that Marina Harse wrote the different masking policies at all of these. Mm-hmm. Um, what are they called? Uh, milongas. Milongas. Yeah. You know, not all of them have. Are, some of them are very relaxed about their masking. Others are are stricter. Others. Most of them seem to leave it up to the dancer or the mm-hmm. person to decide. You know. But, you know, you're often going from diff- partner to partner. Sometimes you don't know who you're dancing with. You just kind of meet them there and, and dance and have this experience together. And so you really have to, like, I guess, trust in the effectiveness of your <laughs> vaccine. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I didn't realize that, and Marina talked about this in the story, there are some tango leads that are actually initiated through, like, from chest to chest or from cheek to cheek. That's where the lead begins, which I oh, thought really? was fascinating. I mean, you're essentially just, like, hugging someone while dancing for the yeah. entire the entire session. Um, I mean, if we're talking about concert dance, we're talking about these highly controlled environments, Set choreographies, set partnerships, make sure everybody in that space is vaccinated, Mm -hmm. you make sure everybody's tested, you can feel relatively safe. But like the whole magic of social dance is the opposite of that, is the idea that you can meet a total stranger Mm -hmm. at a milonga or a social, this also club and know that you can have this like sublime dance experience just because you speak the same dance language. Like you need that element of randomness to make it all work. And that yeah. element of randomness is what makes COVID precautions so much more difficult. I guess what's encouraging about the tango story in particular is the relatively few COVID breakthroughs that have happened. Uh, you know, I think it sounds like most of these malongos have been happening since June or so, but there's been really not a whole lot of breakthrough infection. And I think one of the guys said this tango should be a case study for the effectiveness of vaccines, you know, so that's encouraging to know. I love that quote. Yeah. You know, for some reason, this made me think of the other week, I saw Caleb Teicher's show Mm -hmm. at the Joyce Swing Out, which is all about Lindy Hop and swing dance. And there's this section in it where the dancers used canes to partner each other. Like oh. one held onto one end of the cane, the other held onto the other end of the cane, and they communicated the leading and following through the canes. Wow. And I was remembering, I think I saw earlier in the pandemic that there was a salsa group that was doing the same thing. They were trying to practice social distancing by literally having like, I think it was six foot poles that they would partner each other through. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, really. Maybe it's just sort of, in some ways, that visual like captures the whole spirit of social dance, like the ability to improvise through whatever challenges are thrown your way is part of what mm-hmm. makes you a good social dancer. And our our like hunger to dance with each other is strong enough to generate some kind of ingenious improvised solutions to pandemic problems, that yeah. kind of impro- improvisation happening on multiple fronts there. Do you remember there used to be a guy, like a busker in Times Square, who had this gimmick where he had a it was like she was like a mannequin or some sort of doll 
and he would <laughs> they would do this tango it was the funniest he would like wear her around his waist or something <laughs> and he was very quite quite skilled dancing with her <laughs> but i was thinking about him when as i was reading him like that would have been the perfect social distancing solution i guess <laughs> covid friendly um, tango with your mannequin right <laughs> exactly um we'll include the link to marina harse's tango story in the new york times in the show notes it's really great please do check it out All right, that's it for us this week. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Bye, everybody. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.